late summer of 1941 until war's end in 1945, a total of 78 Allied convoys consisting of approximately 1,400 merchant ships plus their Navy escorts sailed from Iceland and weather permitting from northern Scotland to the Russian ports of Murmansk and Archangel. This most dangerous icy northern route became known as the Murmansk Run. These Arctic convoys delivered 4 million tons of supplies from Great Britain, Canada and the United States, including 3,000 of the much-needed Hawker Hurricane aircraft, plus tanks, military vehicles, trains, weapons, ammunition and fuel. From the very beginning, brave Canadian sailors served on the ships making these extremely hazardous runs. One fine example was young George Evans from St. John's, Newfoundland, who despite being only 15 years old, joined the Norwegian freighter DS Einvik heading for Britain. Only days out of Newfoundland, the DS Einvik was sunk by the German U-boat U-501. Four days after that, two Royal Canadian Navy Corvettes, the HMCS Moose Jaw and the HMCS Chambly, sank that same submarine, U-501, while George was still taking his four-hour shifts on the oars, rowing an open boat with 20 other survivors clinging to life on the North Atlantic. Nine days after the freighter DS Einvik had been destroyed, the lifeboat with George and his shipmates finally landed on the shores of Iceland. After only two weeks in hospital recovering from exposure, dehydration and starvation, George was on the next available ship to Britain. Months later, George signed on to the crew of Dutch freighter SS Peter de Howe, and subsequently, headed through treacherous Arctic waters to the northern Russian port of Murmansk. His job assignment was to hack away thick sea ice off the ship's deck and equipment in ocean swells of up to 25 meters. And this was not to be George's last trip to Murmansk. At the start of the war in 1939, Russia, or the Soviet Union as it was then called, and Germany became reluctant allies. This despite Adolf Hitler being a stout anti-communist who battled the original Antifa in the streets of Germany before coming to power in 1933. Hitler mistrusted what he felt was the Jewish influence within the Marxist leadership and was publicly vocal about his feelings. The German command's vision was of a united Europe under German leadership. This was in many ways similar to the current European Union, only that this unified Europe was to be created and maintained by the German military force, instead of a mutual agreement between the various heads of state. By June 1940, Germany's military had occupied Norway, which it held until 1945. A year later, in June of 1941, with a preemptive strike called Operation Barbarossa, Germany abruptly turned on its ally, Communist Russia. This after both sides had repeatedly breached their mutual agreements regarding occupied territories, resulting in mounting distrust and raised tensions. Germany may also have had its sights on the very lucrative and much needed oil fields of West Siberia. Taking advantage of this turn of events, Britain and its allies, including Canada, aligned with their former enemy, Russia, in order to stop the German advance into bordering countries. At that time, Russia was sorely lacking in supplies, modern weapons, and military leadership, having just endured the German Blitzkrieg. And in the past two decades, the viciousness of the Russian Marxist revolution, the Bolsheviks' extermination of its anti-communist dissenters, plus the tragedies of World War I. Despite being heavily engaged in their own life and death battles with Germany, Britain, along with Canada and later the US, committed to help Russia. Churchill informed the Russian leader Stalin that Britain would send a convoy every 10 days. 
This proved impossible due to a lack of ships and the severe winter conditions. However, the first seven convoys arrived successfully in northern Russia with much needed military equipment. In an attempt to cut off this supply route, the Germans threw the full weight of their air force and navy against the convoys as they sailed past the coast of German-occupied Norway. Attacks by more than a dozen German submarines, known as U-boats, and dozens of aircraft simultaneously were very common. Arctic convoys took 10 to 14 days to arrive at their destination, with each of the 10 to 40 cargo ships carrying 10,000 tons of cargo, representing 360 tanks or 425 armored trucks. As Russia had only eight destroyers, it could not provide any convoy protection. Allied warships were also in short supply. This left the Arctic convoys a relatively easy target in open seas. The temperatures were frigid. The winds were strong and the waves were sometimes 25 meters high. Sea spray would often freeze immediately on the ship's upper surfaces, creating a heavy coating of ice which would cause a ship to capsize if not quickly chipped away. Using onboard equipment and walking on deck in such conditions was a great challenge. The trek was so dangerous that strict orders were given that no merchant ship was allowed to stop even to rescue sailors who may have fallen overboard. Many of the runs took place in winter to take advantage of the almost constant darkness in the northern seas. Although harsh weather and Arctic pack ice took their toll, Allied sailors wished for a dense fog or wind-whipped storms. Both offered protection from German attacks.